All right, I got my calculator and uh, I came up with 12.195%. Um, remember, we agreed on three decimal places, so I guess that works. Um, and so that's the recombination frequency calculation. So that's 15 divided by 123 times 100. And then you drop the percentage to get the map distance, and you drop the percentage, and that's your map unit. So 12.195 map units. So you draw a general chromosome, put the letters M and D on there. It doesn't matter if they're capital or lowercase, because different organisms have different combinations of those alleles. But no matter what, those alleles or those genes are separated by 12.195 uh, map units of distance. So that's your map, okay? Okay, so then let's say you've done two-point mapping with different genes, and now we're gonna try to create a composite map. So you're given uh, a pair of genes, the two-point mapping's already been done, the calculation's been done, and they come up with a recombination frequency. So remember, recombination frequency equals map units or centimorgans. And also you got to remember that 50 means unlinked or it's not a number that's usable for mapping because it probably means the genes are unlinked. So we don't use it. All right. So we, what we really have on this set of data is that A and D are eight map units apart. A and B are five units apart and B and D are 13 units apart. And you have to composite it all onto the map, the single map that I've drawn here. So any chromosome from this, hypothetical organism that has these genes. What I usually do is I would start with the biggest one. So put B and D sort of as um, bookends, I guess you could call it. And then, so that's got to be 13, but then you've got to put um, A in there in a way that matches the rest of the data. So A to D is eight and A and B is five. So it makes sense put A right about here. Now when you first just look at A to D, A could also be over here, but then you realize that doesn't work when you look at the other piece of data. So this piece is 5 and this piece is 8 and those pieces add up to a total of 13 map units. So then that's your, your map. You guys will draw it more neatly than I will. Okay. I'll post up a practice one for that as well. Okay, um, Drosophila genetics was worked out quite a bit using these kind of mapping uh, and recombination frequencies. Some other organisms as well. The thing is you have to be able to cross the organisms quickly in a controlled way and get a lot of offspring. Human maps have we do have some recombination frequency data that we have put on maps, but usually because we can't dictate how to, to the crosses are going to happen, and because each cross only gives you a couple of progeny, um, there's, you know, there's logistical problems in getting enough data for human maps. There's other kinds of mapping, though, but this kind of mapping based on recombination frequency and uh, converted into map units or centimorgans all of that, that goes by the name genetic mapping or genetic maps. This is a genetic, a very simplified genetic map of all the chromosomes in Drosophila melanogaster. Um, Drosophila, in the, except they don't show the Y chromosome. I don't, I'm not sure uh, why, but um, they show chromosome one, which is the X chromosome in Drosophila. That's how they decided to do it. Uh, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, and chromosome 4. But what they're doing here is they're compositing so many genes that instead of showing the distances between all the different pairs of genes, what they do is they set one end of the chromosome arbitrarily, I think, as zero, and then they mark where the gene would be relative to that point zero. But you can figure out the distance between the genes just by subtracting. So if clot eyes is at 16.5 and black body is at 48.5, then the distance between these, you just subtract 48.5 minus 16.5, and you can figure out the distance between any 
two of these. We're not going to do any of that though, but that's how they um, composite this and then the, they display it like this. Now in human genetics, um, we do have linkage maps, like I said, and um, what that leads to is something called a haplotype. Okay. So when there's a new mutation, a new, let's think of a new disease allele or a new uh, a mutation of any kind in the DNA, it, by definition, that mutation is linked to whatever else happens to be on that chromosome at that time. So a sporadic mutation has to start somewhere. It has to happen in somebody first, in some gamete. And all of the genes, or I should say all of the alleles around it become or are by definition linked. And we have located mutant mutations in the DNA, we call them single nucleotide polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms. That would just be a place polymorphism. What that means, that would be a place on the chromosome, a particular place on the chromosome where people tend to have different nucleotide letters. So most people are exactly the same for most of our nucleotides. Like if on chromosome 11, I have an A and then a T and then another T and then a G. You have an A and a T and another T and then a G. So for the length of the chromosome, most people are the same. But then there will be certain locations, let's say at, oops, let's say at position 1095 on that chromosome, what we found is that there are certain positions where I might have an A, but you have a G and somebody else has a C. So it's weird, but it turns out that there are like these single positions where people are widely variable in what letter, what nucleotide they have. The rest of the chromosome are identical, but, you, but we've been able to narrow in on these single nucleotide polymorphisms so when a new mutation arises, it's immediately linked by definition to any nearby single nucleotide polymorphisms. So what we end up with is a haplotype is just a, a description of all of the SNPs that tend to that tend to be inherited together because they're tightly linked. So if you have certain mutations that are close together on the same chromosome, they will tend to be inherited together. And what they've noticed through a lot of studies and sifting through a lot of data is that there are certain combinations of SNPs that seem to crop up with certain individuals, or I should say certain disorders, individuals who have certain disorders. And so they've been able to link for example, certain combinations of very particular SNP types to complicated disorders like bipolar disorder. Um, and then they've also been able to link certain SNP haplotypes to people who have adverse reactions to very particular drugs. Now, why? So why do we do this? Why do we care? Um, first of all, it can be predictive. In other words, if let's say that you have a certain haplotype, because I, maybe I did some DNA testing on you, if I was your doctor or your geneticist, and we found that you had a certain haplotype, and maybe I was going to prescribe a certain drug, but it turns out that a lot of people who have your same haplotype have not responded well to that particular drug then that might inform me as the doctor, okay, I might not want to try that one first. Nothing's 100% guaranteed, but it informs the doctor to make choices that are more likely to be more uh, beneficial. So the more of this data we get, the better decisions can be made. Not perfect, but better. More likely to give us a good outcome. So, 
Um, another reason that we care about linkage is we we look for haplotypes or uh, and groups of SNPs that are found with people who have a disease or disorder when the genetics of the disorder is unknown, and that can help us narrow in to the vicinity of where that not yet discovered gene is actually located. So it can be predictive for helping us to understand what kind of outcomes or what kind of phenotypes might happen in a person. And it can also help us to find genes that we haven't been able to find yet. So the last little bit is, did Mendel, Mendel encounter linkage? It actually turns out that there was one pair of genes that Mendel worked with that should have shown linkage in a dihybrid cross. But Mendel never published data for that particular dihybrid cross. And so that leaves us wondering whether he performed the cross and then the data was weird and not like not a nine to three to three to one and he didn't know what to do with it. Or was that just a pairing that he never got around to doing? We don't know, but it's kind of a, what do you think? Um, there's no answer for that. There is a, um, what we call it, urban legend, historical myth that Mendel had a gardener that helped him and the gardener was a drunk. So maybe he, maybe Mendel thought that the guy messed up the data. I don't know, but it's kind of interesting to think about that, um, when we now know where these genes that Mendel studied are located, and it turns out that there should have been some linkage in the data, but he didn't do every possible combination of genes. So we don't have, we don't know if he, he ever did that cross. Mm -hmm.